Okay, real talk, I get like half my ideas just off of dumb things I see on the Bird app. Like, this was an all-time classic from a couple months ago. Pedestrian overpasses should not exist. Not only are most inaccessible, they are a symptom of making pedestrians need to put in a lot of effort just to avoid inconveniencing cars. Pretty innocuous and hard to argue with that one. But then a blue check chimed in with this banger. Wrong. Pedestrian overpasses are romantic and offer a chance to take in the scenery. They also allow people to cross the street without waiting for the light to change, reduce the chance of being killed by a car running the light, and encourage people to get more exercise! Exclamation point. Based on the blue check's track record, I'm gonna guess it was mostly being contrarian just to drive engagement, which is a thing that happens on social media. But it got me thinking, there definitely are a lot of bad pedestrian overpasses, but are they all terrible? So today we're gonna look at why they get built, and we're gonna look at the bad, the terrible, and a couple that are probably acceptable. It's all up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics, always welcome. But this is just one that's been on my mind since the very beginning of the channel. Now, yes, of course, pedestrian overpasses are romantic and aesthetically pleasing. No one's really doubting that but they are generally built for pretty utilitarian reasons, usually because it's considered infeasible, unfeasible, to interrupt whatever form of traffic is going on at ground level. So first, let's talk typology. You've got pedestrian bridges over freeways, which, what are you gonna do? You can't really put like a rectangle or rapid flashing beacon on a freeway. It's gotta be grid separated. But you do have to say, this kind of overcrossing is not only romantic and scenic, but also pretty reliably quiet and clean. And it allows you to get out and enjoy fresh air that is definitely not laced with any carcinogens at all. Then there are ped bridges over rail, pretty common since rail operators are super persnickety about granting new at-grade crossings. These can be over freight tracks and rail yards, but a lot of the time it's over, say, a regional rail line to provide access to a station. So not super objectionable. And that brings us to pedestrian crossings over arterial streets, usually strodes, which Okay, let's be real. Not especially romantic or scenic, but definitely involve a lot more exercise. These are usually mid-block and often pretty far from the nearest signalized intersection. What you would really want to do in a location like this is put in an appropriate crosswalk treatment, like a full ped signal or at least an RRFB. But have you looked at the methodology for actually warranting these kinds of devices? This is National Cooperative Highway Research Program report number 562, which includes the methodology that most jurisdictions use to decide whether to put in at-grade treatments and what kind. I'm not gonna go through it in detail. I'll leave a link down in the description, but just a couple comments on the methodology. First, the busier the street is, the harder it is to warrant a full ped signal. And second, warranting anything at all depends on you having data that shows there's already a sufficient number of people crossing the street at the particular location. And it all really amounts to, I don't know, justifying building a bridge by how many people are swimming across the river. Anyway, in a lot of cases, the only thing you can get the city traffic engineer to sign off on is a pedestrian bridge, which is usually the most expensive solution and the one that's least convenient for actual pedestrians. Then finally, you've got pedestrian bridges at intersections. This should be extremely rare, since if you've got a signalized intersection, it should be trivial to have crosswalks and pedestrian signal heads. Although, if you really think about it, it's pretty wild that we ask people to cross the street at the precise point where there are the most turning conflicts. A signalized intersection is a complex operation and people don't always do or even understand what they're supposed to be doing. There was a really interesting study back in 1995. I'll link it in the description. They did a survey and they found that around half the people thought if the flashing don't walk comes up when you're partway through crossing the street, you should go back to the curb. A depressingly high number of people thought a car turning right on red 
had the right of way over a pedestrian crossing with the walk signal. And a lot of people thought a walk signal is some sort of guarantee that there won't be any turning conflicts, even though there's almost always a built-in conflict with right turning vehicles and sometimes left turning vehicles if there's permissive phasing. There's just a lot of stuff we expect pedestrians to understand and to have faith in to even cross at a signalized intersection. It really calls into question a lot of the assumptions behind our transportation system, if you really think about it. So where do we actually get pedestrian overcrossings at intersections? Well, it has to be a really busy intersection with tons of pedestrian activity. And you know, researching this video kind of made me want to do a 10 busiest intersections in the world video, but I wouldn't even know where to start with criteria. You can make an argument for Shibuya crossing in Tokyo. I mean, that is a lot of pedestrian crossing activity, although Tokyo is kind of the world capital of pedestrian bridges. You could look at something like Place Charles de Gaulle, which is huge with a ton of intersecting streets and pedestrian tunnels. I'm sure you could make an argument for some place in, I don't know, Shanghai or Delhi, or say 42nd and Broadway, where you've got just a ton of pedestrian activity and the busiest station on the New York City subway system. But for this, I kind of wanted to know the single signalized intersection that has the most approach lanes. This would exclude something like July 9th in Buenos Aires, where the cross section is so massive that a single intersection actually has multiple signals. Now, instead, we're gonna come right here to Las Vegas. So before we get to what I believe is the largest signalized intersection in the US, and it's accompanying extremely convoluted but highly useful pedestrian infrastructure, just a reminder to drop a like on the video if you're enjoying, subscribe if the spirit moves you, and let's check the numbers. We now have enough subscribers to fill Caro Road, home of Norwich City. Great stadium, and I love that there's a Holiday Inn right in the corner with a pitch view. You know, so you can eat a 20 pound room service cheeseburger while you're watching the Canaries get relegated. Again, sniff. Okay, first let's take a look at what may be the single largest signalized intersection on the planet. Let me know down in the comments if you can find something bigger. But this is Las Vegas Boulevard at Tropicana Avenue. You've got triple lefts on the north and south legs, double lefts on the east and west, four through lanes in each direction, except the northbound approach, and dedicated right turn lanes on all four approaches. That's 29 approach lanes at one signal, and four massive pedestrian bridges. So why is this such an enormous intersection? Well, first of all, connectivity. Because of the airport, you'd have to go way east to find the next north-south through street, and way south to find the next east-west. So a ton of traffic naturally gets funneled to this single point. The airport itself generates a lot of traffic. And then you've got five of the 10 largest hotels in the US within a half mile of the intersection. You know, I thought about doing a video on the 10 largest hotels in the US, but yeah, you can just look it up yourself. Anyway, you've got the MGM, which includes the Grand and the Signature. You've got City Center, which includes the Aria and several other properties. There's Mandalay Bay, which includes the Delano and the Four Seasons. The Luxor, which features what I believe is the world's largest atrium. And the Excalibur, which I believe is the world's largest Motel 6. Those last three are all connected by a tram that puts you right on the southwest corner of the Strip and Tropicana. And you've also got the New York, New York, the Tropicana, and the Park MGM, all big hotels loading pedestrian and vehicular trips onto the intersection. And depending on what day it is, you might have a hockey game or like a UFC fight at T-Mobile Arena. Oh, incidentally, four of the other five largest hotels in the US are within half a mile of the second most bonkers intersection in Las Vegas, which is the Strip and Flamingo Road. So first thing to note here is, yeah, these are massive trip generators, but like Midtown Manhattan has tons of restaurants and hotels and 
offices and housing, but you don't see intersections with 29 approach lanes. So let's just concede that the transit situation on the strip is not good. You've got the kind of unfortunately named Deuce, which is a bus that definitely gets stuck in traffic because the only time I ever saw them, they were bunched together. Or you've got the monorail, which I didn't even bother filming because you have to walk like a country mile through a casino just to get there with a super circuitous and disorienting path per best practices in casino design. So a cynical but probably somewhat truthful way of looking at this is these pedestrian overcrossings up and down the strip are a massive infrastructure investment that's really intended to allow vehicular traffic to flow unimpeded. But a more charitable take is the overcrossing allow free flow pedestrian movement. No one has to stop and wait three minutes for a traffic signal. And a lot of the overcrossings connect directly to destinations. Several of the resorts designed or redesigned their entrances to be at grade with the bridges. I actually gave some thought to how all this would work without pedestrian bridges. What would the intersection of the Strip and Tropicana need to look like to accommodate the number of pedestrian crossings you see every hour. You can definitely get 30 or more people a minute crossing the west leg of the intersection in each direction in the evening. So I actually went out and did a bit of data collection just to see how the signal functions and kind of extrapolate how it would all work without pedestrian bridges. In the evening, you've got a three minute cycle that really has six phases that accommodate all the movements. For a pedestrian crossing across the west leg, you could run a ped phase along with the southbound through movement, which is phase two, which normally runs about 50 seconds today. So how much time do you need for a walk phase? Well, it's a 124 foot crossing, curb to curb, but really the design as it exists today wouldn't work. You couldn't use these pork chops for pedestrian refuges because you'd have something like 100 pedestrians queuing up every three minutes and more if you count the ones going eastbound. So you're really looking at a 148 foot crossing at 3.5 feet per second, which is kind of the conservative walking speed you assume for these things. So that's about 42 seconds of flashing don't walk that you need. Then you typically assume about seven seconds to discharge 24 pedestrians into the crosswalk. So we're talking maybe 30 seconds of walk time to be safe. So that's a 72 second walk phase for the west leg, which is over 20 seconds more than what exists today. If you imagine similar issues on the other three legs, that might be around 90 extra seconds that you need in the signal cycle. And a longer cycle means we need longer turn lanes, and more green time for the protected left turns with even larger queuing areas for pedestrians at the corners. So you can see it's a cascading problem. So to be honest, I'm actually kind of a huge fan of the pedestrian overcrossings on the Strip. I mean, sure, it would be cool if the Strip was a car-free urbanist wonderland, but there's a time and a place. It's Las Vegas. I mean, we're talking about a city where walking around with open containers is actively encouraged. The drivers are a bit erratic. So do you really want to funnel pedestrians into obvious conflict points? When I was out on location, I was filming at Harmon Road, which is a newer set of overcrossings, and unfortunately I missed it, but when the signal went to all red, this dude did a full sprint diagonal across the intersection. Why? Who knows? Human behavior is unpredictable and unfathomable, and you really just want to build as forgiving a transportation system as you can. Anyway, that's all I've got. Leave me your thoughts on pedestrian overcrossings down in the comments. Let me know what you think is the busiest intersection on the planet. I don't know if there's a right answer, but I like hearing the arguments. And keep the great topic suggestions coming. Thanks for joining. I'll be back with a new installment next week, and I'll see you then.